Welcome back to the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much for being a part of the Menopause Movement. If you're watching the replay on Facebook or somewhere else, we appreciate you so much. Now today, we welcome Petra Coveney to the podcast. Petra is the founder of Menopause Yoga. It's a new style of yoga designed to support women on their menopause journey. Menopause Yoga seeks to educate and empower women with the knowledge needed to embrace their menopause as an opportunity for self-growth. She's a senior teacher and teacher trainer for the British Wheel of Yoga and Yoga Alliance professionals who have both accredited her new menopause yoga teacher training course. And this has attracted teachers from all over the world, including the USA, Canada, the Middle East, as well as Europe, Greece, Spain, Sweden, and Norway. Petra is a member of the British Menopause Society for Health Practitioners and works with Dr. Louise Newson and Dr. Shazadi Harper, who are leading campaigners for menopausal women's rights. Her approach combines Eastern yoga, breathwork, meditation, and the philosophy of traditional Chinese medicine with Western medical science, cognitive behavioral therapy, nutrition and complementary therapies. Petra developed menopause yoga after experiencing her own menopause at a time when there was no support in the UK and doctors were wary of prescribing HRT. She is motivated by a drive to support women by improving menopause education and training a menopause yoga teacher for every town in the UK so that women can practice where they live and build local support networks. Now, during the podcast, we talk about Petra's deeper purpose, why and how she got started with the menopause yoga, the history of menopause in the UK, where Petra lives, the loneliness of menopause, finding truth in Eastern and Western philosophies and melding them together, how many women feel as if they're having dementia with menopause and the cognitive impact loss of estrogen has, the role perspective shift plays in menopause, the grief that often occurs at the beginning of menopause and what that means, a new way to view the change of menopause, the importance of journaling and growth, and much more. Now stay to the end so that you can join in while Petra walks us through an exercise to reframe hot flashes and then trains us in a powerful breathing technique that will calm your nervous system when you practice it. At the end of the episode, make sure you visit drmichellegordon.com slash podcasts where you can find the show notes plus the links to the books and resources mentioned in the episode. And if you enjoy the episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you are always the first to know when each episode is released. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for all of the five-star reviews. And if you haven't left a review yet, please take the time to review the podcast. This helps more women to find it and get the help they need during the disruption of menopause. No one should have to go it alone. We've also created a free training to help our podcast listeners go from mental misery, you know, those hot, sweaty, sleepless nights, irritable, low mood, feeling like an alien beamed down and took control over your body, piling on the weight and looking pregnant, feeling like managing your menopause is a full-time job, to mental mate, someone who's not bothered by symptoms, happy and content with life, and even dropping extra weight and fitting into those pre-menopause clothes again, among other things. To access the free video training, go to learn.menopausemovement.com forward slash start. And thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement. Now let's move on to the interview with Petra. So we got Petra Coveney here, and Petra, thank you so much for joining us on the Menopause Movement Podcast today. I'm excited to have you here. I'm so excited to, to be speaking to you as well. This is very exciting for me. Yeah. So you have a business around menopause yoga, and so what I'd like to know from you is uh, how, how did you get started uh, doing you know, menopause yoga? What's the backstory there? Okay, so... It- I went through a, a slightly early menopause. This was about eight years ago. So I'm 54 now, out and proud. I don't mind saying it. And um, I went to, into my menopause around my mid 40s at a time in the UK where menopause was a dirty word. I mean, seriously, it was a dirty word. Women didn't say it in public, they didn't uh, discuss it with their friends. 
there was very little, if anything at all, written about menopause. And the only help you could receive would be to go to your GP, ask to take HRT, and they would usually refuse you because at that time, people were very concerned, very wary still about that research, which had shown a link with HRT and breast cancer. So I, I left my GP back at the age of sort of 45, 46 saying, well, you know, is there anyone who can support me? Are there any support groups that anyone I can talk to? Because I'm feeling completely lost and alone here. My older sister hadn't gone through menopause. Uh, none of my friends had gone through menopause. My mother had sadly passed away. As I said, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And at that time, I, I offered to set up a, a support group for women at the doctor's surgery, but they wouldn't allow it. They, they said they couldn't allow it in the surgery. So I was on my own. And so what I did is I did extensive research even back then, the internet is not what it was now. Facebook was not what it is now. So I researched books. I got books from America because America was much more forward thinking and much more open about this. Interestingly, in Europe, the Europeans are much more open and talk about menopause and sort of there's some literature there as well. I even reached out to a wonderful elderly yoga teacher in Brazil who'd uh, created something called hormone yoga therapy, an amazing woman. But, I, but being a journalist, I used to be a journalist, and the journalist in me didn't want just to have knowledge from the East, which would be yoga and breath work and those kind of aspects. I wanted to know the science as well. I wanted to know what is happening to my body biologically. And so I joined the British Menopause Society, which is for health practitioners. Quite funny because it was little old me, the yoga teacher, in a, a huge, you know, conference halls full of doctors and gynecologists and nurses and scientists. And I think they kind of looked at me rather sort of oddly, like, you know, what is what is she doing here? But I, I used my own personal experience as a motivation to gather to, together information from the East, information from the West, bring it together to create menopause yoga, not just for myself but for others, because I felt passionately that if I was lost and alone, there must be other women out there too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's really interesting because we have very similar stories. And, you know, in my, in my mid forties, maybe, maybe a little later, maybe my late forties, uh, I started going through menopause and, and, and what happened for me was I would be doing nothing. And all of a sudden I would just feel this flush coming up out of nowhere. And how, how they manifested for me was, it was like, I felt like I was embarrassed. So when, when I get embarrassed, I mean, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of uh, Irish and Scottish in me. And so when I get embarrassed, I just turn completely beet red. And so these, the, it, it was indistinguishable between hot flashes and embarrassment. I didn't know what was happening. Like, what is this? And then I thought, oh, maybe it's a hot flash. And so I, you know, started asking my, my doctor friends, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor. I, I, I'm like, okay, well, what is this menopause and how do I beat it? And why do I suddenly have 50 pounds on me? And so, so, you know, and what happened for me was I was like, it was a lot of, you know, well, you just have to wait it out. You just have to suffer through it. And I was like, uh, -uh I, I'm definitely not going to do that. And, and so I also did something very similar and spent years researching and then found a, a program that worked for me and was able to lo lose 50 pounds and, you know, kind of figure out uh, how to find zest in my life again. So we have a, a similar thing, although for me, I tried yoga, I did. And I was working one-on-one -on -one with a yoga teacher. And actually, you know, I, <laughs> I paid her in advance for a whole bunch of lessons. And I, I probably, she probably still owes me like 10 or 15 lessons. Uh -huh. And I just found yoga. I just hated it. I, I, I kept trying, I tried and I just found, you know, the only thing I liked was like at the end, the Savasana and and I really liked, you know, that, that I felt at the very end, like the, the meditation part, like I could do anything. You know, I've since discovered that the yoga postures are part of a bigger, a bigger spiritual practice. And I don't do a lot of yoga other than, you know, some pranayama breath work and, and that sort of thing. But what I think is, is, you know, really interesting is we have, you know, kind of parallel paths in a lot of ways.
It, it's so interesting. And just to give you sort of another uh, illustration of that, the fact that, you know, you and I are talking to each other. I train other teachers now. I've been running workshops for women you know, across the country and I'm now training teachers all over the UK. In fact, I'm, te I'm training teachers from all over the world. They're flying in to the UK to do Not right now. <laughs> not, not right now. Exactly. Not yeah. Now. But yeah. We have people from you know Canada and America and Brazil and across Europe, which has been really, really exciting and interesting to connect with those yoga teachers from all over the world. But the point I'm making is that yoga teachers practice yoga, but they still go through menopause. Yeah. So they're coming to me and saying, my yoga practice isn't working anymore. Something's, you know, I need more. You know, what what's going on? And and so that's where I can bring the Western medical science, the cognitive behavior therapy, um, all those other sort of modern techniques to yoga teachers. But similarly, doctors such as yourself and other doctors that I work with in the UK, Dr. Louise Newson, Dr. Sajadi Harper, who are leading campaigners for menopausal women's rights in the UK. They say to me, Petra, we're doctors, we're taking HRT, and yet it's still not everything. We need yoga. So I think it's this wonderful kind of recognition that we, we both need, we need both. We need a combination and the style of yoga that maybe you were practicing with your teacher, maybe it wasn't the right style for you, you know? Hard, hard to say. I mean, you know, hard to say. I think, I think for me, it was just part of a greater spiritual journey more than anything yes. else. And so it was helping me to get on the right path. But in, in terms of, I mean, you know, you know what, what I teach, I mean, I have a program and a membership. We, it's the menopause movement, obviously you're on the menopause movement podcast. Here it is. But we, we also have a, you know, we have the menopause movement, a membership, and we have the, we have the mental system, which helps women to kind of look at everything differently. And for those women who can't take HRT or don't want to take HRT because of the risks, what do you recommend for them? Because there are a, a plenty. I mean, I, I tried HRT and what happened to me was I got a period and I was like, I'm, I'm done with that. Uh -uh, no. And so, you know, <laughs> I was like, I, you know, if taking HRT, the biggest issue for me, I mean, wasn't so much the hot flashes, the night sweats. I mean, it definitely was a lot of weight gain that was upsetting me. But as a surgeon, the biggest, the biggest problem for me was not being able to recall things that I knew. Oh, I'm getting my brain back. Yes. I mean, the cognitive impact of the yeah. dopamine in our bodies is Women are only now just finding out about how much this affects our, our brain, our cognitive abilities, not just in word or um, thought recall, but also that sense of overwhelm. I mean, it's a new word that we've kind of coined, isn't it now? <laughs> overwhelm, where you just, the smallest, tiniest task can feel so overwhelming. And you yeah. think, how can I possibly do this, you know? And I, I remember at the time when, you know, I was going through my symptoms, I thought I was going through dementia because, and it was terrifying because I thought it was an early dementia. And interestingly enough, you know, research that is being done now is seeing some benefits, not conclusive, so we can't say this outright. There is some evidence that taking HRT could delay dementia in some people. It's, mm. in, it's an interesting new area of research. But yes, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's terrifying as an intelligent woman, as a woman who is top of your game, you know, as a, as a surgeon to, to be in that situation where you can't recall. I mean, it, it, it is scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the, the thing for me is, you know, I'm, I'm a high performer and I, I spend a lot of time looking, you know, looking for excellence and being excellent. And I wasn't during those few years that, that I was doing my research, I wasn't excellent. And that was, that was very hard for me. And it's kind of funny because I've, I've always coined, you know, called myself a, a chronic underachiever, which is, you know, I really believed that for a long time until I changed my beliefs. But, you know, I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to skate by in medical school, but I was in medical school, you know, and I was going through yeah. medical school and my, my son had cancer and I was still just skating by, you know, I, so I had a lot of things on my plate and I was still able to do it. And, you know, and so, so then when this, when this happened and I was in the middle of my career and I was like, you know, why can't I remember the name of anatomical region or why can't I remember the name of that drug that I need to prescribe? Those, those were things that were really 
upsetting me. And I never thought that I was having dementia, but I was like, this, this is weird. And so it was coming like, um, 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 you know, that kind of thing. What, what happened was, you know, for me, it was a, it was just a matter of, you know, kind of cracking the code on the lifestyle and the lifestyle that I had to, what I had to change in my own lifestyle. And, you know, when you look at my photos from 2014 and, and 2020, it's really, really a massive change. And just last month, so it's the end of March right now, we're doing this recording. You, this probably won't be aired until the end of April. But sometime in, in March, in February, I think, a Facebook post came across my feed. And I had taken a selfie and I said I had joy and I put the date on there and it was full of joy and it was from 2014. And I took one look at that and I went outside and I did a selfie and I was like, wow, you know, because the changes that happen when you make, when you make changes little by little, by little, little, they add up, changes add up, but you don't see the cumulative effects unless you take that snapshot from the, from the past. And so I was like, wow, because I had really changed. And I thought that I was still, you know, like super fat and, and all those things. And it, it was obvious that I had lost like 50 pounds or something. That's so wonderful. What a yeah. great story. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Getting that perspective. I mean, that's one of the things that when you're going through the, the perimenopause, especially, you, you kind of lose that sense of perspective and you're very in the here and now because something odd is happening to you and you feel kind of out of control, out of control of what's happening to your body, what's happening to your mind. And as you said earlier, that sense of sort of embarrassment about having a hot flush, all of these are sort of, you know, emotions associated or linked to menopause symptoms. But if you change your perspective, if you change the way you look at it, if you stop feeling embarrassed about having a flush, you know, it, it really can make a huge difference. And as you said, beautifully, those incremental changes over time add up to a major transformation. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do as well through um, menopause yoga is to help women to transition positively to the next stage of their lives. So one of the things I just heard you, you talking about, Dr. Gordon, was you said you took HRT and you got a period. And you're like, no, I'm done with that. Yeah. But it's so interesting because there are women who are very still attached to that menstrual cycle. I mean, I was the same as you. I'm like, I'm done. Hallelujah. You know, yeah. no desire to, to go back to that menstrual cycle. But for other women, they, they feel deeply connected as a woman to that. And the end of that menstrual cycle for them... Uh, brings a, a sense of grief and loss for the fertile woman they once were and apologies for this light shining through and a fear a fear of what the future will bring and i think because menopause hasn't been in the past openly talked about as i said it was a, a taboo word in some cultures such as the stiff upper lip culture of the uk and so women didn't know what it was i mean still Women in this country, they still don't know what is the menopause. They don't know what the perimenopause is. It's like, oh my God, how can this be true even today? But they certainly don't know what happens in that dark black hole of postmenopause. And that for them, for many of the women I, I work with, they're terrified. We're, we're quite individual women. We're quite uh, courageous pioneering and not afraid to go into that darkness and step in and go okay bring it on but other other women you know it it is it's the unknown and I think by helping to support them and as you said showing how those incremental small changes can lead to this happy person this happy and yeah. healthy person that you are and by the way I don't know how old you are but you look amazing <laughs> I'm 54 55 I'm 55 you look yeah. about 35 I'm six. <laughs> well, it might be the it might be this the, the shaved head which you know I shaved my head on March 6th to face a fear I'd always wanted to do it since I was 18 and <laughs> and I just decided that I would just do it and I did it live on Facebook I'm like okay I'm gonna face my fear and do this and and I've since had to cut my hair once. And, you know, now that, you know, we're in, we're still in lockdown from COVID. So I, I bought a shear and I cut it myself, but it was the wrong <laughs> kind of shear and it was actually a beard trimmer. And so it was like, it's just a disaster. So I have a new clipper coming, but I, it won't get here until April 18th, according to, well, to, well, to Amazon. Can I 
Hey, that proves my point that I knew you were courageous. Look, look what you did, you shaved your hair off. I but did, you, I did. You look absolutely amazing. You're a real, well, someone to look up to in terms of how you've managed your health. Your skin is glowing. You're, you look so healthy and well. And, and I'm not wearing to, any makeup. I don't wear makeup very often. Every once in a while I will. And that's why I want to ask you, you know, what have you done in terms of changing your lifestyle in terms of nutrition? Uh, yeah. Coffee or exercise? Or has it been more a sort of a spiritual cognitive change? It's it's a combination of all those things actually. And and we go into really in deep depth into that. And you know, the the program that I that I have called the Minnow System is designed to take women from mental misery to mental mate. And so what happens is that, you know, we talk about how suffering is optional in menopause. And the way to end your suffering in menopause is to really truly understand it. Menopause from perimenopause all the way to, you know, the end of your life, really, you can have menopause symptoms for over 20 years. Yeah. And so, you know, my feeling was, well, I'm not going to suffer for the rest of my life. This is crazy. I don't, I'm not somebody who wants to suffer. And so how can I change that? And so what I did was I really just started looking at what kind of changes do I have to make in my life to make it better? And, and then I made those changes and lo and behold, I had, you know, I had a 50 pound weight loss and I had a lot more energy and my skin started looking better and, you know, all those things. I mean, I did get rosacea. That was one of the side effects of menopause for me. And I do take medication for it, but you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I'm very healthy and I'm getting healthier because <laughs> of this and, and the community that we've, you know, we have a carefully curated community of women. So, you know, it's not like just anybody can come in, you know, that, People have to like, they have to go through an application process. And you know, so it's not easy to get in, but once you get in, there's so many ways to make yourself better. And, and the minnow mates um, are very protective of themselves <laughs> and each other. And so it's, it's really a fun group of women. You, you've um, tapped into something else, which is a really important part of the menopause yoga. And, you know, again, I'm coming at this from a yoga perspective, but bringing in actually very much holistic care that includes medicine, et cetera, et cetera, natural remedies, nutrition, exercise. So I'm coming from my perspective, you're coming at from yours, but we're kind of meeting in the middle, which is wonderful. We really are. And, yeah. um, one of the most important things for in menopause yoga is community. In, in the yoga tradition, it's called sangha, community. And what I kept hearing from women over and over again was a sense of them saying, I feel lost. I feel alone. I feel abandoned. I feel afraid. Right. And I feel like that, an alien has beamed down and taken control of my body. Yeah, something yeah, that I hear a lot. And the and other, the other thing that I hear people say, uh, women say this is that it's like a secret society that nobody ever talks about. Yeah. And that's why we have to talk about it more because that's right. it's scary. And we can talk about how this other stage of your life can actually be really exciting. So uh, in addition to community and networks, I encourage the women who come and join the menopause yoga workshops and the yoga teachers that they create these networks locally so that they stay in touch with each other and they right. share information. And so not just the women who come to my workshops, but the yoga teachers are benefiting so much from this because we're now creating a network of teachers across the UK, but across the world who are still talking to each other through social media, sharing their experiences and their ideas and supporting each other through this time. And one of the things that I talk about is something I'm sure you would have heard about before I'm just trying to find one of my books here we are I have a huge library of books as I'm sure you do and, of course um, one of one of the, the beautiful books that you probably can't tell but I'm I'm part Chinese but only only a small amount and I was drawn very much to this beautiful book called traditional Chinese medicine for women reflections of the moon on water yeah and there's this wonderful writer this woman writer she talks what's her about name I don't want to pronounce it in case I get it wrong. I think it's Zhao Lan Zhao, but the book is Reflections of the Moon on Water. It really is a wonderful book. And in the Chinese traditional medicine, there is this view that women, when they come into their 50s and 60s, when they cease having a menstrual cycle, it's what they call the second spring. 
And the second spring, so you have your, your spring, which is your youth, your adolescence. Then you have your summer, which is your womanhood, where you're fertile, you're active, you're working, maybe you're bearing children. Then you have your autumn, which is where you start to lose your fertility, you know, like the leaves falling from the tree. And then you come into winter. And that's the place where most people get stuck and then they don't get to experience the next stage. But through people like you, through people like me, helping to raise awareness of how women can change their nutrition, exercise, mental health, the way they view themselves in the world, then they can transition to the second spring. And you said to me earlier, you said you feel like you're getting fitter and healthier than ever before. And I feel the same way. I feel yeah. like I'm come into myself and one of the ways that uh, she describes it is she says it's about coming into a woman's wholeness mm. coming into wholeness and so it is a spiritual journey you know spiritual whatever denomination you might be you don't have to have a church or a particular faith but we're all spiritual beings deep down yeah, we like to say this a lot. I mean, I say this a lot that we're spiritual beings having a human experience and our job is to kind of discover that. And sometimes it takes us a long time and sometimes it doesn't, you know, and, you know, I know, I know some people who are in their thirties still who are super spiritual and have already awakened to that. And, and then there's, you know, me and I was, you know, in my fifties or maybe my late forties when I started to really realize that I needed to have a spiritual practice. And if I didn't have a spiritual practice, I wasn't going to be successful. So they were really tied together for me that, you know, if I'm going to reach a million women or more, you know, every year, the, the way to do that is for me to really deep down, let go of it all and be a spiritual being. You know, and, and then I had people when I was first starting this to say that, you know, women don't want to be associated with the word menopause. It's yes. like a negative thing. And I thought, you know, we have the menopause movement. We have the menopause movement because we're trying to end the stigma. Yes. I talk a lot about the patriarchy. I talk a lot about the fact that women have been, you know, the boot of the man has been on the woman's neck for millennia ever since written language and there's a great book you can read called the alphabet versus the goddess all about how this happened and it started with written language that all god all gods were female and then they kind of got systematically destroyed as we started using our right brain and then the rise of the patriarchy and that's a great book written by a man more to my point the reason i didn't want to get rid of the word menopause is that we as women you know we're going to go through it. It doesn't matter. You know, you live long enough. It's a privilege of a long life. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, we had the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, you know, abusing women. And then if they're, if they're not fuckable anymore, then they're not worth anything in Hollywood. Right. So yeah. all of these, all of these things that have really, all of these things that have pushed us down and pushed us down and pushed us down are really just, they're, they're like the fuel now for the rise up, you know, the Me Too movement, all of it. Exactly. I mean, it's so interesting listening to you talk because the way you're describing the, the woman's experience through menopause is what I talk about in my workshops. I talk about the significance of culture and society and a woman's experience of menopause. And, you know, if you're in a, a society where women have been valued in the 20th century and the 21st century as sexualized beings used to advertise and market products, then is it no surprise then when you come to a stage of your life where not you, you look amazing, but if you know <laughs> your face gets wrinkly and you know your body um, doesn't look sexual in that same way before, where is your sense of self-value or self of sense worth? I mean, you know, we're quite dynamic, powerful women, but uh, other women will feel like they, they have lost their self-esteem. Yeah. And so yeah, that the role of culture and society has a massive role to play. And the way I like to describe it is, I don't have the book in front of me right now, but in, in Ayurveda, which is the Indian uh, sister science to yoga. So Ayurveda is like the sort of the healthcare, holistic healthcare that goes along alongside yoga. And in Ayurveda, when you reach the 50s and 60s, your older age, women are uh, called vata, the age of the wise woman. And women are valued and respected for the wisdom that they have accumulated 
through the experience of life and having reached this wonderful older age. And so what I encourage in my workshops, my teacher training is to remind women, you know stuff. So you remember when you were going through your puberty and puberty was kind of scary and you're like, oh, I've got my menstrual period. Oh my God. And it's, you know, it's a bit nerve wracking and I'm going to become a woman. Do I want to? I'm not sure. All of these emotions. But when we go through the other side coming out of fertility, we're not teenagers anymore. We are educated, amazing women who have survived, as you said, so many hardships in your life. We all have hardships. We have knowledge that we can use to share with others. And once you remember that you know that stuff, it can be really empowering for women, can't it? Yeah, it really can be. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that when menopause is the age of wisdom. And I just wanted to go back for a second, because one of the things that you talked about near the beginning was that, you know, the end of the menses is a grief process. So the beginning, the beginning of the menses is like this exciting, I'm growing up, you know, and then the body's changing and we start to develop breasts and we develop pubic hair and, you know, we start to like, we have to accept our bodies or we have to change. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. And that was a big thing for me was like trying to decide, you know, I had three brothers and I always wanted to, you know, my God was male and I, you know, everything was male. Right. And yeah. so I, everything, I saw everything through this male perspective. And so I saw myself as male as I began to mature sexually. And it wasn't really until probably my, my thirties maybe that, yeah. or maybe even my, you know, my late twenties when I was pregnant, when I realized, okay, I am fully female because now mm -hmm. I've had a baby and that may, you know, I'm pregnant and that means yeah. that everything yeah. works the way it's supposed to. So there's that. And then the fact that nobody tells us this is coming. Nobody yeah. talks about it. And, you know, one of the things that, that I talk about initially in the program in the minnow system, and if you're, if you're the type of woman who is interested in, you know, understanding what's happening with your body, then make sure that you go to learn.menopausemovement forward slash start, and you can find out all about it. But one of the things we talk about is, is this a second period as uh, puberty? Is this a second puberty? Because, you know, the body is changing. Our emotions are everywhere. We don't recognize ourselves. We've got these mood swings that take us you know, here and there. And, and then we start snapping at the people that we're supposed to love. A lot of women end up like changing their relationships in this time and determining what's most important to them and deciding that they didn't want to stay in something that isn't fulfilling them. I mean, so there's a lot of opportunity for change. There's a lot of opportunity for change so long as we embrace it as an opportunity for self-growth. So yeah. what I notice is and the women who don't give them themselves time to pause, sit, reflect, look back on their lives and consider what they need to let go of before they move into the next stage of their lives. If they don't do that, if they keep on clinging on to the old ways of living, being, relationships or how they worked, how they ate, the exercise, if they don't change and embrace what's happening to them, they will get stuck and they will have a very miserable time. And I find it really deeply upsetting. In the United Kingdom, the highest rate of divorce is in women in their 40s and 50s. The highest rate of suicide for women in the UK is in their 50s. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is breaking my heart. And that's why women need to be supported, you know, in the way that you're doing, supported by the doctors, supported by other women. So, because this is not right that women should have been left in the dark, kept in the dark, made to feel ashamed about having hot flushes, ashamed or embarrassed about the loss of, the loss of fertility, we then we need education to help these women to transition positively to be these awesome wonderful women they can be in this second spring yeah I, I mean i like the idea of second spring i'm not sure i really a fan of saying calling it a transition and the only reason i say that is that you know we think a transition in terms of transitioning out of the body and into the spiritual realm and it's not a death i don't think i mean there is a grief process that's involved i guess i mean you know, 
I, I remember I had a big, big, big uterine fibroid a few years ago, probably 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit less. And I had to go for a u uterine artery ablation. I mean, the thing took up my whole abdomen. It was like, I pushed my hand on my belly one day and I was like, God, there's a big mass there. So I went for a uterine artery ablation. And so for anyone who doesn't understand, it's, they actually kind of put a, they put a needle. It's like a, it's, it's like a heart cath in a sense, but they put a needle in the artery and then they go and find the, the vessel that's supplying the uterus and they put a coil in it. So, so that the fibroid doesn't get, doesn't get blood supply anymore. So it degenerates. It's just a way to avoid surgery. And I remember how I had to go for an endometrial biopsy which if you've, if you've never had one of those, they hurt. Like if there's no, maybe labor is a similar kind of pain. I mean, it's brief, but it, wow, it was really painful. And then I had to, you know, then I went for this procedure. And when I met with the radiologist who was going to do the procedure, he said, well, are you done having children? And I said, yes. And then I had to like, look at that and say, wow, I really do have to let that go. I can't mm -hmm. have any more kids. And I can't adopt any kids. I mean, it's just, you know, I was just looking at the fact that I, that part of my life was over and I'd, I'd missed the opportunity to have any more children. And it was a little bit emotional. I have to say, you know, you know, anyone who's kind of going through or is, you know, going through perimenopause and looking at it, I mean, there, there are real emotions there that, that we really must acknowledge in order to kind of move on to the next you know, the next phase, I guess, you know, I just, I just don't, I don't love the word transition. I, I wish there were another word that could. <laughs> you know, it is a transition from being fertile to not being fertile. Yeah. It, it yeah. is an A to a B and it's indefinite. You know, I think it's very hard for women who've had a surgical menopause, but they've had a, the womb removed or the fallopian tubes, whatever it might be. And remember, there is premature ovarian insufficiency for women who are you know, younger than 30. There is a grief and a loss associated with that. And women can go into a very deep kind of depression as a, as a result of that. But I like to use the word transition in a, in a different way. And I think that there, there is a need to let go. Another way to visualize it is one of the things I say to my women is imagine that you're going to move from your big old house or your flat where you've accumulated all your stuff over how many years, you know, 50, 40 years, and you're gonna to move to a really she-she nice little apartment, your, your, your dream apartment, yeah? The place that you, you want to go and spend the rest of your life. But this apartment's a lot smaller. So what are you gonna take with you? Are you gonna take that huge old wardrobe, you know, the big boxes of stuff you haven't looked at for years? Or could you leave some of that baggage behind? And I guess it kind of taps into what you were saying earlier about looking back and, and seeing it as an opportunity to let go of stuff that no longer serves you, no, you no longer need. As we move into this other stage of our life and we want to create space for new things to happen, new experience, yeah. not the end, it can be an opportunity for newness. I mean, look at you as a result of your menopause, you've created this whole movement worldwide. Isn't that awesome? It you is. When you're 20 or 30? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's true. I mean, it's it's so exciting to be able to talk about it and and show women that that it doesn't have to be an end. You know, it really is a beginning. And it it is what we make of it. I like to tell women that everything is a belief and there's always a, a lot of resistance at the beginning when i say that and then mm -hmm. i and then i'll say something like well you know what is true and they'll say you know whatever their belief is at that time and i'll say well, okay is it true 100 percent of the time because the only thing i know that's true 100 percent of the time is that if you drop this thing it's gonna fall <laughs> right other than that, our beliefs are just things that we put, picked up along the way that have created a box around us. And, and, you know, when we start to push outside those beliefs and, and trust me, it's not easy. I mean, you have to really be willing to take a look, but when you yeah. start to push here and there and, oh, you don't have to stay inside that box, you know, that box of belief that, that there's no, there's no reason to do that. And what we don't see is we don't see that the beliefs that we have about everything are just keeping us inside 
this small little box. Exactly, including the beliefs that you talked about earlier about, you know, who you are. Are you male? Are you female? Are you this? You're the, are you a high achiever, a low achiever or whatever, underachiever? I mean, those are kind of mental constructs, aren't they? That yeah. we've got ourselves in with uh, because it makes us feel comfortable. We go, OK, I'm this uh, rather than thinking I'm that. I have just a little quote, if you don't mind me reading sure. it's from that, that lovely book. And it talks about this. I know it's not your favorite word, but it talks about that, that transition. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, um, it says, where in the past we were focused on relationships, family, careers, and nurturing others. Our self-esteem and identities were defined by our relationships. But now we can now develop an independent sense of self. Our yang energy, that's the male energy, rises and we often become more passionate about our beliefs interesting yeah more able to stand up for ourselves and more able to express our emotions and opinions we feel more able to direct our energy to new projects new opportunity and there's a lovely chinese saying here it says women in their 30s are wolves uh, women in their 40s are tigers and women in their 50s are dragons. Yes. I kind of love that. <laughs> I love that. I love being a dragon. I am such a dragon. I, you know, that's really great. So what can you just give the audience some practical like tips? I mean, maybe right now, depending on what's happening in the world by the time this airs, you know, at all, at all times, I think that the more we are able to manage stress, the better our lives are. And I think that yoga is really good for it, for that. You know, it, it starts off, I mean, that was part of it for me was I wanted to get fit, but I also want, you know, when I started doing yoga, I wanted to kind of understand a little bit more about my breath and, and how to manage stress. And so it would be really great if you could just like walk us through a little exercise or something that the audience can take with them to, to use. Oh, well, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. So absolutely, stress has scientifically been proven to exacerbate all of the menopause symptoms, whether that's anxiety already or hot flushes, digestive problems, insomnia, fatigue. All of these things are exacerbated by stress in even putting weight on cortisol levels, actually you know, accumulating more weight in the body. So if you can practice a paced breathing exercise that helps you to calm your mind and relax your body, you are instantly going to be able to lessen and even eliminate many of your symptoms. So interestingly enough, in the United Kingdom, the British Menopause Society worked with some scientists on cognitive behavior therapy. And okay. this is called managing hot flushes and night sweats a cognitive behavior self-help guide to menopause. I use some of this in my workshops where you change your perception of your experience of a hot flush. And I can talk you through or talk your listeners through that, but also maybe practice a little paced breathing exercise to help calm the nervous system. It's just one of many pranayama or breathing exercises that we do in the workshops. But then the last thing I'd say is it's important to socially connect. You must have a network of women around you or else you're not gonna get through this. You need their support. This is a time to come together, a very exciting time. And journal. That's, I just want to. I just want to say something in there. That's why we exist. That's the purpose of the menopause movement is to create a community of women who can support each other. And what we found in our group is that the women, you know, they come for the, the understanding of menopause and they stay for the community. And the community is so so tight knit. And they're always like texting and calling and, you know, hanging out together. And before all this COVID stuff, we were going to have a live event in the UK. We were going to have a meetup in Dublin. And, you know, now, right now we're doing virtual meetups, yeah. you know, for, for the whole community. So even the free, the people who don't pay are invited to come to our free Zoom parties. So we have one a week just to increase our community and help each other, you know, kind of get through it. 
Exactly. And this is how it would have been in the past, maybe not on such a worldwide scale, but women would have talked to each other within families, within villages, within communities, and, and supported each other through this stage in life. So yes, community is really important. So is journal writing. So yeah. I know that some people are fans, some people are not fans of journal writing. In the yoga practice, it's called Swadhyaya. And that means connection with the self. So you become aware more of yourself. And by writing the journal with headings such as, what did I eat today? What did I drink today? What exercise did I do today? What were my thought processes today? Did anything else happen today that may have impacted uh, on my emotional well-being? And then to chart your menopause symptoms to see if there are triggers and connections. Because only by understanding your unique biology, your unique psychology, can you then make those connections and start to make changes? And I'm sure that must have been something that you did when you were going through your perimenopause. Is that right? Yeah, I did. I did some of that. I mean, I wasn't so concerned about symptoms, so I didn't chart symptoms. I mean, I wasn't a period charter either. So I, I wasn't, that wasn't for me. But what I do find about journaling is that when I take the time to journal, my spiritual and personal growth are more pronounced. And when I don't do that, I'm not growing as much. And so I actually have a practice now where I have a meditation and I journal every single morning because I don't want to, number one, lose contact with source. And number two, I want to continue to grow because if I'm going to serve, you know, I have to continue to grow. Exactly. Hallelujah. That's what we do in the yoga practice. We do our, yeah. we do our journal writing in the morning. And we make connections between those things that I mentioned earlier. And we also maybe practice uh, one of various different visualizations, which would be the gratitude visualization, a future self actualization, a whole range of different techniques around meditation and mindfulness exercise, just so that we can start to feel the joy in the world. And yeah. And that inner sense of bliss that's always there, it just kind of gets clouded by all of this other external stuff that, you know, gets dragged into us. One little exercise, which is a cognitive behavior exercise, and um, I can send you this, it's actually on the website called Women's Health Concern, and it's also in this book. Uh, I didn't write the book, I'm not, I'm not getting money from promoting it, okay. I just really helpful let's why why don't you just walk us through it and if we can get a hold of the pdf we'll hook it up in the show notes but if you want to just walk the listeners through this cbt exercise that'd be really awesome great okay so it's about this particular cbt exercise is around hot flushes and we know that a lot of women in western culture feel embarrassed about having hot flushes because they're sweating and yeah. back in my day, you know, I'm, I'm quite old, you know, back in my day, we were brought up believing that women did not sweat, men sweat, women perspire. Glisten, know? glisten. <laughs> glisten, glisten, yeah. yeah. So when I was going through my hot flushes, yeah, you do feel kind of shocked or embarrassed that you're sweating in public. But my I talk to women and I say, hold on, if a man is sweating in a meeting, he's just a man sweating in a meeting, no one kind of remarks that he's got sweaty armpits or a sweaty forehead because he's a man. You know, what, why, why should we allow that to be different for us? And then I remind them also that women, a lot of women now go to a gym, don't they? Go to Zumba classes or this or that, and they break out into a sweat. I would hope so. Exactly. If you didn't break <laughs> in a sweat, you're like, give me my money back. Yeah. Right. So that, that, it's okay to sweat in those circumstances. So why is it not okay to sweat in other circumstances? So we just sort of start with that kind of premise. And I'm just going to talk you through some of the things that women might say when they're having heart palpitations and a hot sweat. So imagine you're that person and you, whatever the circumstances, it could be a hot sweat brought on by the fact that it's a hot day or you've had a hot cup of tea or coffee or maybe something embarrassing has happened to you or you feel shameful and whoosh, you feel <laughs> that hot sweat coming up. It's usually from here upwards, although some women say it starts here at the top of the head and goes down. But women, the thoughts that a woman might typically think are, oh no, I can't cope. 
yeah, I can't cope, I'm out of control. And as women, we're used to being in control, aren't we? We're, we're middle-aged yeah. women, we're in control of our lives. We don't like the sensation. So instead of thinking, oh no, I can't cope, everybody is looking at me. I feel even more anxious, more embarrassed, more out of control. And then maybe as a result, you either leave that room or leave that place and maybe just don't go outside because you're embarrassed about flushing or having this experience in public. So instead, what you could say to yourself is when you feel the flush uh, rising, excuse the noise outside, you say to yourself, let me see how well I can deal with this flush one hot flush at a time. So just deal with this one particular one. And then you say to yourself, when you think, oh, everybody is looking at me, are they? Are they really looking at you or are they actually self-absorbed in something else? I will notice my flushes more than other people. They may not notice. And then that, that thought, I'm out of control. Maybe say to yourself, there are things I can do to retake control. And one of those would be the breathing practice. And then another thought might be, these hot flushes are gonna go on forever. But you say to yourself instead, they will gradually reduce over time. And I promise women that if they practice this breathing technique, they will get more in control of their hot flushes. One of the things to think about, and can I just ask quite personally, when you were about to give birth, I presume you had contractions. Of course. Of course. When you had the contractions, did you do that exercise where you count how many breaths it takes to get to, or how many seconds to get to the end of the contraction? I didn't. I actually got an epidural pretty early. I did do the ha, he, ha breath, yeah. which was taught in Lamaze. So one of the things, you know, when you're going through a contraction is you know it's going to come, but you know it's going to go. And so you can count how many seconds it takes or how many breaths it takes to get to the end of the contraction. And then once you know, let's say it's 14 breaths or 14 seconds, you know that when you're halfway, you haven't got very long to go. So that again, yeah. just makes you feel more in control. So when you're having a hot flush, really useful to step back and observe your own hot flush and start counting your breaths, your inhalations and your exhalations. And then noticing how many of these does it take to get through the hot flush? So that when you next have a hot flush, you go, ah, it's only gonna last 30 seconds or 60 seconds. And so I'm more in control, I can do this. And then, I like to tell people just when it comes to, when it comes to getting through something, you just have to go halfway in a little bit more. That's right. That's right. You just that's have to go halfway in a little bit more because once you get half, just a little bit more past halfway, and I do this all the time when I have like a really hard interval on my workouts, especially on the bike workouts. Yeah. So if I can get just, you know, if it's like a three minute, like hard output kind of workout, and I just have to get to a hundred and, you know, I have to get to, what is it? It's 91 seconds. And if I can do 91 seconds and I can do the rest, the 89 left, you know, and so it's just a mental thing. It is. And that's another, it's that same technique just to get yourself through the hot flush. And then once you get to know your own hot flushes and how long they last, you know, you're going to feel more in control. And then you just start your paced breathing. So paced breathing is just simply slowing the breath down. We use a variety of techniques in the workshops around thoracic chest breathing and what we call ocean breathing, which is where you make a <sighs> slow sound in the back of the throat, but you breathe with your mouth closed. And that means that when you're breathing, you can hear the sort of sound of the ocean in your ears. You know, like when you're at the beach and you hold a shell to your ear and it was yeah. that soothing sound of the ocean. So you learn how to make this very soft sound in the back of the throat that soothes your nervous system, calming your nervous system. So these are various different techniques, but really what we're aiming to do is everyone now sit comfortably. I suggest that if you're on a chair, you have your feet flat on the floor, your spine upright so that your diaphragm can rise and fall easily. So you're not hunched over. Have your hands just resting gently onto your thighs. 
And I suggest you close your eyes just so that you can see more internally. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. <laughs> if you're driving, definitely don't close your eyes. If you're walking, <laughs> don't close your eyes. But yeah. sit somewhere and just to take a moment, 60 seconds out of your life to breathe. Breathing deeply. So start to breathe in through the nose. And then breathe out through the nose. Simple, isn't it? No problem at all. And take a deep breath in through the nose. Pausing at the breath just for a moment and then breathing out through the nose. And can you relax all the muscles in your face as you're breathing so that your forehead becomes smooth, there's nothing to worry about. The muscles on your cheekbones and around your mouth, they become soft. And you relax the jaw so that the top layer of teeth separates slightly from the bottom layer of teeth. A little space. And then your tongue. Soften at the root of your tongue. Good. And then we continue breathing. Breathing deeply in through the nose. Pausing at the top of the breath and then visualizing the breath like a waterfall. Allow it to cascade out of you. See if you can breathe in and out through the nose rather than the mouth. It just helps to slow the breath down. And that's what we're looking for is a slow, steady, even breath so that the inhalation is of equal length with the exhalation. Good. Now, Dr. Gordon, with your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to open your mouth. Breathe in through your nose and make a very soft ha sound as you breathe out through your mouth. That's it. Like the sound of the ocean, breathe in through your nose and breathe out through the mouth. That sounds beautiful. Good. Two more times. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through the mouth. I'm feeling soothed already. One last time. Deep breath in. And out through the mouth. Now close your mouth, but make that same ha sound as you breathe in through the nose. That's it. And the same ha sound as you breathe out through the nose. Make a soft, soothing sound like that ocean wave coming in from the sea, reaching the beach, and then gently receding back into the ocean. Good. Now continue breathing in this way, noticing how this breathing style has helped you to slow your breath down. And the nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system will rest and digest as compared to the fight and flight. The rest and digest part of your nervous system listens to the sound of your breath. So keep breathing in this way. And it's soothed, like you're soothing a, an animal or soothing a baby trying to rock it to sleep. So you're soothing your whole nervous system with this gentle ocean breath. Continue to breathe in this way. And I've noticed that my dog has just gone to sleep in the corner of my room. Animals respond instantly to this style of breathing. Babies respond it goes directly into the parasympathetic nervous system, helping to calm and focus the mind. So if you were having a hot flush, you could very quietly make the sound in the back of the throat. You could even have your eyes open. And you'd slowly count the number of breaths it takes to come to the end of your hot flush. And you'll notice if you practice this over time, the length of your hot flush will start to shorten, minimize, and even become eliminated completely. Now slowly open your eyes. 
and just notice how you feel. That's great. I think what's really great about having a breath that can calm the parasympathetic system, and it's interesting because I just interviewed Deirdre Fay, and you can go back and, and watch that. But she talked about a waterfall breath, uh, which is what something you just said. But the, the whole breathing in through the nose, out through the nose with ocean sound, especially in this era where we have so many people on the front lines of this pandemic, this is a fantastic method to just calm yourself down in the middle of a crisis. Oh, my so, gosh, you're so right. You are so yeah. right. You have a mask over your face, just doing this very slow breathing technique, soothing yourself. And I have to tell you, I have used this technique in so many different ways. I don't like to fly. So if I get on an airplane and I have that fear of flying, I start the slow breathing practice. And you had a microphone to your mouth so we could all hear, but you can actually make it a really, really quiet sound that only you can hear. So you can be standing at a bus stop be on an airplane. You could be in a really terrifying situation. You could be on an underground tube in central London crammed into uh, you know, a, a train and it calming your nervous system. So absolutely, this could be something to help frontline staff. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So uh, where can people find you? Well, I'm at www.menopause-yoga.com, but I'm also on Instagram as at menopause underscore yoga and I'm on Facebook too and I'm uh, over the next couple of weeks I'm going to be putting more free videos online on Facebook and Instagram so that people can learn some of these techniques because we all of us whether you're having a hot flush or an anxiety attack or not we all of us need to find techniques to calm our nervous system and I don't want to touch wood challenge myself too much but I don't get ill because whenever I feel stressed, I calm my nervous system down. And I think that helps my immune system. I, th I think it does too. But then, you know, there's also the whole like power of the subconscious mind and the mind body connection, the mind body spirit connection. And, you know, the, when you read Yogananda, Yogananda talks about how you can have, you know, complete health and vitality just through meditation and you don't even have to eat. And so that gets really into the metaphysics of it all, but we're not going to go there today. So, <laughs> but, but, but there is, yeah. And so yes. I want to connect with another woman who is empowered who has embraced her menopause, whether you like it or not, you're in your second spring because you are that dragon woman. You're out yeah, there I, doing I, I agree that I'm in a second spring and, and that I feel much more, you know, I'm aligned with who I am. And that's, this, this is my calling. And it's really important to help more and more women to find themselves and heal the relationship with themselves through menopause. That's why I'm here. So I, I just want to thank you for being on the, on the podcast today. And I am hoping to bring you back again for some more techniques in the future. I would love to share some more techniques and I will be hoping to join your movement and be more part of it um, because it's just yeah. a wonderful thing that you're doing, connecting with women all over the world. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon, and I wanted to take a moment to share what one of our community members has achieved since she's been working with me. Amanda has had an amazing transformation. Amanda was struggling with joint pain, hot flashes, forgetfulness, sleeplessness, weight gain, and an angry mood. In addition, she lost her confidence and self-worth as menopause crept up on her. Since joining the Menopause Movement membership, Amanda's quality of life has improved in ways no one could have predicted. She has truly transcended the symptoms of menopause and is now living her best life. This is what I want for everyone in the community. Take a listen to Amanda's story. I just want to show you what's possible when you join the community and do the work. Transcendence is available for you too. Now here's Amanda. Hi, my name is Amanda. I am 54 years old and I live in the UK. At this moment in time, I'm in a fairly good place in my life. Recently, I've lost 18 pounds and I feel healthier and more content than I have done in a long time. However, it hasn't always been this way. Back in October 2011, I had an accident which resulted in a serious injury and surgery 
and subsequently changed my life forever. And over the next few years during my recovery, menopause crept up on me, but I didn't realise what was happening straight away. I started suffering from more joint pain. I went from always being cold to feeling like I was going to internally combust several times a day. I was getting really forgetful. My sleep pattern was terrible. I piled the weight on and looked pregnant and I felt angry all the time. When things were at their worst, I felt incredibly alone and very down. I lost my confidence and self-worth and I felt completely misunderstood and confused about what was happening to me. I received very little support or information from my GP and there was limited information on the internet, but what I really wanted and needed was someone to talk to. The turning point for me was at the beginning of July 2019, when completely by accident, I came across Dr. Michelle Gordon's Facebook page on the menopause movement. At that time, she was doing daily live streams and I started listening to them. I related to a lot of what she was saying and I was really interested in the variety of topics about menopause that she was talking about. The alternative ways to manage menopause symptoms in a more natural way and how your mindset is the key factor to transforming your life more positively. I was also really interested to listen to the other ladies in the group and what they had to say. Ladies who had been or were still suffering from similar symptoms to me. How a lot of them had been able to manage their symptoms much better and how they have turned their lives around and embraced menopause instead of treating it like a demon. Although nervous about taking a risk to join a group I didn't know, I knew that I couldn't and didn't want to carry on living my life the way I was and feeling the way I was feeling. So I made a decision that I too wanted to learn more about menopause, how to manage my symptoms better and most importantly, learn more about my mindset and the fact that I needed help with changing my outlook on life in order for me to get it back. Life is nowhere near perfect and some days I still have my struggles but on the whole I can honestly say that I am in a much better place than I have been for a long time and for my down days I understand better how to manage them so they don't get out of hand. I am now on a journey with a fantastic community of like-minded women, all of whom continue to support each other no matter where we all live, and I no longer feel confused, misunderstood, worthless or alone. For me, this group has been both a lifesaver and a life changer, and most importantly, the one-to-one -one private coaching sessions that are available with Dr Gordon as part of the membership have been invaluable to me. They provide me with an opportunity to discuss more difficult and private issues that I am struggling with and an opportunity to find solutions to address them. Without doubt, I can wholeheartedly say that I owe Dr Gordon and her group everything for showing me how to take my life back and more importantly, take control of it. Joining her membership has been the best thing that I have ever done. However, this course is not for everyone. If you're looking for a quick fix that doesn't cost you any time, money or effort, then this is not the group for you. But if you're in a similar situation to how I was not that long ago, feeling desperate and at the end of your tether, but are willing to invest in your own future happiness and peace of mind, but are unsure as to what to do, ask questions and talk to Dr Gordon. And if you choose to take that leap of faith, you won't regret it, because who wouldn't want to take their life back if they had the chance? If you are feeling like Amanda, you're not alone. There is help for you in the Menopause Movement membership. I want to help you transcend your symptoms and live your best life. To discover how you can become a part of this life-changing community, go to menopausemovement.com.